All right, welcome everybody. Uh, while the remainder of the people, or many more of the people, uh, join us here, I do want to um, give a few words of introductions about uh, the symposium itself. Um, the Social Data Science Center Symposium is a uh, regularly appearing um, event at the University of Maryland. We're very delighted to have you here. Usually we have a mix of audience, uh, people from campus, all levels, students, faculty alike, and uh, folks from the outside, alumni and uh, data science interested people in the region and beyond. Um, not everyone can join at this time, so we usually record the webinar just like this one, and we will be making it available on the SOTA website next week. We plan these events purposefully so that there is time for questions and comments at the end of the presentation. And we ask you to use the Q&A feature at any time during the symposium, right? You'll see that on the bottom. By now, everyone has that down, I'm sure. Um, Sally Keller, our guest today, said that she would be um, happy to answer any questions and has questions to you too, which she will formulate uh, at the beginning of her talk. Um, if you would like to ask your question live, please make a note at the end and you will be called on or you can unmute yourself during the Q&A portion. I will be monitoring that part of the um, Zoom feature. So um, looks like we have a good number here. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Sally N. Keller. She's Chief Scientist and Associate Director of the US Census Bureau Research and Methodology Directorate. And if you're not a JPSM alum and not that acquainted with the Census Bureau, you might not know what that is. <laughs> um, but I, the director collaborates with the teams across the US Census Bureau and uh, actually with researchers around the country, locally, Maryland, and, uh, but also worldwide to find innovative solution and advance pretty much anything that US Census Bureau does, right? And uh, it, it mission I think is to ensure that the US Census Bureau um, stays among the leaders in the economic and social measurement. And um, the, the, this unit, you know, had, uh, you know, very interesting leaders in the past, you know, some of which were faculty members of JPSM, like Mark Little. And so for me, it's, a, you know, personal joy, Sally, uh, that, that you are here and speak um, to our community. Sally Keller holds also an endowed distinguished professorship in the biocomplexity, in biocomplexity and uh, faculty appointments in the School of Medicine, um, Department of Public Health Services, School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, Department of Engineering Systems, and um, the School of Data Science at the University of Virginia. Sally is an, herself an elected member of the US National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and an elected member of the International Statistical Institute, and not the least, very important also for us, a fellow and past president of the American Statistical Association. So with that, Many experiences, Sally, we are looking forward to hearing some of your latest thoughts and plans at the Census Bureau. Thank you for coming. Let's see. Uh, see if I can get this going. So do you all see my see my slides? Yes, yeah. we do. OK, great. Well, um, thank you for inviting me to speak. I'm thrilled to be here today to speak. And I actually do have a question for the group that I hope we can explore together during the course of this talk. And I like to think of this uh, as how do we together sort of walk the statistical last mile? And what do I mean by that? Well, how do we, we spend a, a tremendous amount of energy and effort in the collection of data of all sorts, whether it's through surveys and censuses or data sharing agreements for administrative data, whether it's, you know, scraping things out there in the wild and pulling this in. So we spend a tremendous amount of energy there. But the real question is this statistical last mile of how do we deliver the right statistical information at the right time in actionable formats to address a diverse set of data users, a diverse set of individuals with you know, vastly different levels of data acumen. How do we do that? 
And so that's what I'd like to hear from you about. And I'm going to share with you what uh, at the Census Bureau we're doing to try to tackle that statistical last mile. And why do we have to do this? at all. And part of it is that there's been a lot of changes, you know, from the 20th century to the 21st century. Um, and what drives what statistical agencies do and what researchers in statistics and survey sciences and behavioral sciences do. And it's that there is, you know, rapid changes in technology that we can take advantage of. There's massive demand for information, for data insights, a lot of new data sources. You know, on the downside, there's declining response rates. So our traditional way that we've been building statistical estimates, you know, is challenged. New data tools, why not take advantage of it? Artificial intelligence has upsides and downsides. And then again, just tremendous challenges to our traditional data collection methods. So there's a lot of forces driving change. And at the Census Bureau in particular, we have a value proposition that's been articulated by our deputy director, and what he says is that our success critically depends on our ability to seize the opportunities in front of us to deliver statistical products that address the increasingly complex and diverse needs of our users. That statistical last model. You know, we have to step up to the challenge and we need all the help we can get. So that's why it's so wonderful to be able to talk to you all today. Well, what are we doing about it? So at the Bureau, we're actually trying to flip our focus of how we've approached our work. And for many of you that have been in science for a long time, you'll just go, well, of course you need to flip this focus. So what we need to do is rather than continually asking stakeholders, what data do you need? Which by the way, we don't really deliver data, we deliver statistics. Even if we have microdata files, they're some sort of a statistical product. They, they've come out of a statistical product. So we really need to be instead asking our stakeholders, our users, what information do they need to answer their questions, to reach their objectives? What are the questions that they have? And then how do we shape our statistical products to help provide data insights into their questions, into the purposes and uses that they need our statistical products to support? You know, so that's really doing good science. And so that's the flip of focus that we're making at the Bureau. And what we're calling this is the statistical product first approach, that we want to move from managing production systems, surveys, and data to in production system surveys and censuses to managing data and statistics and the development of statistics. And so that's really quite exciting. And it's sort of putting the end in mind and trying to figure out how do we drive all of the data assets that we have that we can make available to help support statistical product development towards those statistical products that will provide specific insights into a lot of different purposes and uses. So purpose and use, you know, research questions are at the center of what we need to be doing. And we need to be disseminating products to meet those needs. Well, what, what are some purposes and uses? So we've spent a lot of time um, listening to a lot of stakeholders, talking to a lot of folks. Several of you um, in the audience have been in some of the different listening groups. And this is you know, just a small collection of some of what we've heard, that people want to understand and study climate change, broadband deployment. They want to understand tribal areas better, the gig economy, the unhoused, migration. And if you look at these, purposes and uses that our statistical products should try to support, there's not a single survey question alone or a single source of administrative data or a single data collection that's really going to meet the mark to completely support these purposes and uses. We really have to look across the set of assets that we have and bring them together. And we also need to be bringing together the relevant subject matter experts. More examples are differential under, undercount, commuting patterns, counting young children in particular, equity and inclusion, understanding local businesses, and even something as simple as how do we support the development of and the response to grant applications. So there's, and the list could go on and on. You all 
have many more that you could add to this, but the point being that it's no longer a single question that's going to meet the mark of answering some of the questions that the stakeholders have. It really has to be the integration of information. So to that end, we've developed a statistical product workflow, and it's a workflow that we're trying to create a culture within the Bureau, across the Bureau, to have everyone engaging in some part of this workflow. And the workflow has at its center the statistical product development, which is focused on purpose and use. And to get to that, we need to elicit what are some of the questions and purposes and uses our stakeholders had. Given those questions, take a look at what data we currently have. How do we leverage all of our data and leverage all of our expertise to begin to develop some statistical products to help inform those questions? That then leads us to what gaps do we have in our understanding and gaps in our data. And once we see the gaps, that is what should inform new data acquisition, collection, and stewardship. Um, and much research starts with new data acquisition without trying to understand what gaps might exist that, they, that it should be filling. So we're trying to you know, not make that mistake. And then the dissemination of the statistical products becomes really important. And this is sort of in a sequential mode listed here, but the circling arrows for statistical product development in the, in the center is what really keeps us focused on this not being sequential. When we have a question from a stakeholder group that we think we would like to try to address, understanding the data capabilities, the data acumen of that group is really important because that's going to drive the form of the dissemination product. And that's going to then impact every other step in this process. Let me give you a couple examples. This is not, it's not the case that the Bureau hasn't been doing a workflow like this um, historically. It's just that we've, we're really raising it forward to make it center in everyone's mind. So let me talk about a few experimental products that we've developed in the recent years that actually exercise this process quite nicely. And one is our Community Resilience Estimates Program, where during COVID, it became clear that communities needed help in understanding what their risks were in response to COVID, as well as other types of stresses and disasters. And so some estimates were put together that put together ACS data with some of our population estimates data. There's a wonderful tech report out on the Community Resilience Estimates site to see the details of how these risk factors came together. And that was really great. But what happened now, um, just in the last 18 months, is that some colleagues, some stakeholders from Arizona State University, as well as other stakeholders, came forward and said it would be really nice to understand vulnerability of communities to heat exposure, to extreme heat. And the thought was, could the community resilience estimates be used for that? And so we took a look at that question and determined that, you know, this modeling that had come together between the American Community Survey and the Population Estimates Program to create the CREs actually missed the mark a little bit with regards to risk factors that were directly focused on measuring social vulnerability to extreme heat. You know, they're really great for general social vulnerability, but could we do something better that focused on extreme heat? So we recognized that there was a gap, and we also recognized that we had some subject matter expert gaps, so we actually reached back out to Arizona State University to work together to see what, what could be done. We identified three of the 10 risk indicators that we've already had on this platform. It's a very nice platform with interactive visualization. We you know, identified three risk factors on the platform that could be brought together in their own model to actually come up with a heat, um, a heat estimate, a, a heat indicator. And in so doing, we're able to create a, a, a social vulnerability estimate for extreme heat. And we already had a platform that we could very easily disseminate that on that stakeholders already had become accustomed to and were happy about using. So that was really great to be able to leverage other work that's been done because in statistical product first, you wanna be rapid and agile. So you need to leverage past work. But the story doesn't stop there. We're continuing to explore other statistical products that we could potentially put on this platform and ways to improve it, such as incorporating custom geographies and more small area estimation techniques, just making everything more flexible and usable. And even asking the question, what about um, economic recovery as opposed to just social recovery? 
So that's one example that's sort of on the social demographic side of what the Census Bureau gets engaged in. I'd like to flip over to the economic side for a second and give you an example, um, which is, and it's also an example that involves two agencies coming together to try to improve what they can, the, to try to improve the statistics that they can create and ultimately disseminate. And so the Census Bureau has incredibly rich data on race and ethnicity. And many agencies would like to be able to connect to that data with their data. And it pre presents some complications that I'll explain in just a minute. But if that was, you know, but if we were able to do that, there would be huge gains in um, equity, data equity and statistics equity through this cross agency sharing. But we have to be incredibly attentive to implications on confidentiality requirements that the Census Bureau needs to operate under, under what we call Title 13. Okay, so the basic question was the IRS, um, who's always been a good partner with us because we use a lot of IRS data and have great user agreements with the IRS, and we bring a lot of their data inside the Census Bureau and link it up with all of our data and do all kinds of really great research. Many of our researchers in our research data centers have the opportunity to do this as well. But the IRS had a little bit of a different question. They really wanted to figure out, is there some way that we could link up uh, race and ethnicity information to their data such that they could bring it into the IRS? Well, we can't quite do that directly. So um, what, we, what we wanted to do was to figure out, first of all, how would we actually do this linking? You know, and one way to do this linking is to bring IRS data in, maybe with social security numbers, you know, take our data, link it up that way, and then be able to push that back. Um, so, you know, we could, you know, feasibly merge the data, but there was a huge gap here, not in our technical ability to merge the data, but that, you know, laws just simply do not exchange, do not permit the exchange of this, this identifiable microdata. And so we couldn't just directly link the microdata and push it back to them. We had to do something different. And we also had to focus on the fact that we needed to do this with care because not all agencies are bound by using data for statistical purposes. That is one of the Title 13 requirements that we have, that we can take in microdata, we can take in identifiable data, but we can only produce statistical products for statistical purposes, not for administrative purposes. Well, not all agencies have that requirement. The IRS does not necessarily have that requirement. So we had to be particularly careful in the protection of this data because it was going to, it would be possibly um, being used in ways that would make it much more disclosive. So what we ended up doing is we thought about this and he said, well, what if we could create a privacy filter that was based on differential privacy, a formal privacy framework, and we could generate these differentially private race and ethnicity uh, data, link it to the IRS data, and then we could be sending back to the IRS this protected, this privacy protected data file. So that was great. But then the question became, what are they going to do with it? Because obviously, just using the microdata and tabulating this privacy protected microdata as is, is going to give you some pretty crazy statistics. But the point was that we actually had um, and we could provide the, stru the structure, the multivariate structure of the privacy filter in such a way that they could use that to sort of help unscramble the data as they're building statistics. You could think of this as a massive errors and variable problem where you know what the error structure is because we know that in the formal privacy development. And then you can use that to build your statistics in a very formal way. But that presented another little bit of a problem because, you know, it's 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 a fairly sophisticated statistical approach to do that. So what we decided that we needed to do was to actually provide some code 
you know, in our library to help the IRS when they're doing their different data analyses and building their own statistics so that they could pull in the proper air structure and the proper adjustments based on the different attributes that they were choosing in their different uh, models. And so, you know, this allowed us to put a whole process together, which is really quite nice. And it's a process of being able to link uh, formerly private data on race and ethnicity to another agency's data, and then do that in such a way that we're able to help provide the statistical tools that they could use then to build their own statistical products based on that data. So now this is a process that theoretically could be replicated with other agencies. And it's wonderful because we get tremendous value from IRS's data in the work that we, that we do. So it's nice to be able to give them value back to help incentivize their interest in continuing to work with us in partnership on different data assets. So those are two kind of very different examples of a statistical product first approach. So now I want to just step back and talk a little bit about um, just the process of going, you know, going through this workflow. But before I do that, I'm happy to pause if there's any immediate questions or comments. Doesn't look like questions were posted so far, but okay. Um, so I think it's good if you just keep going. Okay, great. So we've talked about, or I've talked about how we need to be eliciting purpose and use from our stakeholders. And our stakeholders, again, go from all of you on this call, from high-end researchers to the public. And so we have to have a way to start illuminating kind of this ecosystem of data users. And this little graphic gives you a sense. But in this graphic, it's really kind of interesting because it's buckets of kind of standard groups. And, um, you know, so for example, OMB and GAO or tribal areas or, you know, states and state demographers, you know, so it's different advocacy groups, you know, so it's kind of people with common, um, common um, motivations for doing things and for having and using statistics as sort of the buckets. That's not necessarily quite the right way to be segmenting our stakeholders when what we're trying to do is to be able to elicit purposes and uses and to do it you know fast and at scale so we need to be thinking about how do our stakeholders come together around various topics like migration it's you know it's not just a state demographer who's interested in migration there are a cross cut of this picture that would be interested in migration or responses to extreme events and those sorts of things so that's a challenge it's almost like a a business school problem of segmentation of users of uh companies and things like that how do we apply some of that type of research to segmenting our stakeholders and then we need to leverage our data infrastructure and in leveraging our data infrastructure um, it, we're really well positioned to do this. We need to go well beyond surveys and censuses, that's sort of the design data bucket, into leveraging as much administrative data that we can from the local levels all the way to the federal le levels. Our place-based data and a lot of other kinds of information comes through opportunity data, through web scraping and other techniques. And then another bucket that's really important is procedural data that we have to be really well um, in tune to and understand how it affects the statistical product development. It could be the change in laws that's going to create breaks in series of some sort that we have to pay attention to. Or a popular one today is all of the responsible AI policies and practices that are, that are being formed. We have to be sure that as we're developing AI models and methods that we are adhering to um, those procedural requirements as well. And then we have a long history at the Bureau and a, there's a long history in the research community on data linkage. We can do data linkage so much better today than ever before. And at the Bureau, we focus a lot on linking specifically people to places, whether it's their, where they live or where they work or where they play, to jobs and to organizations. And doing that uh, full integrated linkage gives us sort of a scaffold to hang a lot of other data assets on that can help support statistical product development. 
we clearly have to adhere to the legal frameworks and data governance that surround what we do. You know, as I mentioned, we operate under Title 13. Some of our partners operate under other titles like Title 26. And so we have to really make sure that we're not going outside of the space of the directives that allow us to do different things and to build different statistical products. And so many people have felt that have felt that that would restrict what we do when in fact it is not restrictive. Our title directs us to acquire and use all sorts of external data for statistical purposes. The foundations of for evidence-based policymaking is encouraging data sharing across agencies and with the in with the private sector. And then the Confidentiality Protection and Statistical Efficiency Act, many of you know as SIPSI, is really helpful because it sets forth a separation of statistical versus administrative use of data. It draws that you know, line in the sand that we can be doing all of this for statistical purposes and to inform things through statistics versus administrative purposes. And we cannot wander over into that area because that, that's not part of our, what our authorities are. And it would also really violate our um, adherence to ethical data stewardship. And then on dissemination, this is one of the areas that I get most excited about is because if you think about what the Census Bureau does right now, we disseminate statistic, statistics and statistical products in two modes. We either create simple public use products. I will agree that it's not necessarily simple to find them on our websites all the time, but 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 they're there. And we you know have public use products that we disseminate, or we invite you. Um, to come into our research data centers, where you have access to the protect to the, you know, to the protected microdata. You actually can do your own statistical product development on that confidential data. There is a huge space between those two extremes that we are now focused on trying to think through how do we fill. And your ideas on this are would be greatly appreciated. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a couple examples. And then finally, the Census Bureau over the last three to four years have been building technologies, enterprise-wide technologies, to help enable the statistical product first uh, process and enable our rapid development of statistical products and the dissemination of those products to meet a lot of user needs. So first of all, we are unifying the way that we ingest data so that a survey, a census, administrative data, private sector data, as it comes into the Bureau, it's coming in through a formalized data ingest and collection system or collection of systems. And then we now are moving everything that we do operationally into the cloud through the Enterprise Data Lake, which is a cloud-based data processing and you know, computing and management area. Within the data lake, we're building these uh, you know, linked frames where we're actually linking, as I said earlier, we're formalizing and creating, think of it as a linked statistical frame that you could sample from or you could simply use in the development of your statistical products that, that links demographic characteristics to jobs, to geography, and to businesses. And then finally, we have our enterprise dissemination services, and many of you are probably quite familiar with how they are right now, but all of that is moving into the cloud and to be much more robust and agile and, and being able to disseminate lots of different forms of statistical products in ways that will be easy to find, easy to access, and easy to engage with. Okay, so how are we moving this forward? So there's sort of three uh, big buckets of things that we need to do to move the statistical product first initiative forward. First of all, we really need to think about our data user engagement and how that needs to change. And again, the Census Bureau has spent a lot of time and energy asking users what data do they need as opposed to what questions are, you know, do they have that are quite burning that we need to help develop statistical insights to support. And then we need to have um, stakeholders engaged in our product development. And we need to really think carefully about how we can expand dissemination modalities to 
meet our stakeholders where they are, and help fill that space in between these two extremes that I just talked about for dissemination. So on the user engagement, um, we are working to try to do this stakeholder segmentation that I mentioned. How do we really illuminate that ecosystem and how should we be thinking about it differently than we have traditionally? Um, we have more than 60 units in the Bureau that do stakeholder engagement, you know, but they're sort of focused on their piece when purpose and use cuts across those pieces. And then finally, um, how do we engage you and others in the development of statistical products? We can't do it all. How do we add value to what is already going on externally across our stakeholders so that we're not duplicative? We wanna add value. We wanna know what is it that we can be developing that is gonna add value to what a data center is already producing or a state demographer is already uh, creating. And then on the statistical product development front, we, are, we really need to leverage the experience of the experimental, experimental product development process that the Bureau has had in place for about five years. So the, the, the Bureau um, does research and releases research products. We release official statistics, which you are probably most familiar with. But we also filled this space in between those two extremes in what we call experimental statistical products, and we disseminate those. The CRE is an example of that. And this is where we try to understand user needs and actually deploy some statistical products, you know, maybe in early stages, maybe not with all the data quality that's built into an official statistic, but official statistic, but with complete acknowledgement of what the quality is. And to then iterate with the stakeholders to figure out if we should continue to develop this product, if we should move it into full production at some point into an official product, or if we should simply sunset it and write a few research papers. And then another part about the statistical product development is designing and implementing rapid demonstrations. And I'm gonna to talk to you about a few of those that we're engaged in right now. And then on expanded dissemination modalities, we're really trying to understand what would a tiered access dissemination environment look like for the Bureau? You know, how else can we be releasing products, not just different forms of products, but providing maybe different levels of access to different parts of our confidential data to marry up with your data in the development of new products? And how do we maximize, you know, access in our research data centers, how do we kind of expand access in our research data centers? Right now, uh, most users in our research data centers are from tier one universities, research universities. It's not an easy lift to understand how to use all this data, but how do we change that up some? How do we actually get more users at different levels of data acumen in our RDC system, maybe working with the really um, experienced folks to just broaden that access of activity going on there. And then how do we improve, improve and expand the contextual information about our data? And I have an example on that in a second. Well, what do we mean by tiered access? I mentioned we have these two modes of access right now. Our future state is how do we really offer our users, providers, partners, more standardized options to a whole spectrum of modalities? And how do we recognize and accommodate different data sensitivity assessments and just risk tolerance levels of partner agencies. Because a lot, a lot of the data that we're talking about here and that we use is not just data that is census title 13 data. We would love the opportunity to be able to think of how we can help other agencies have their data engaged in more tiered access. And how do, and then for us, how do we start to invest in solutions? You know. I mean, real dollar investment in solutions across the spectrum. Okay, let me close out with just sharing a couple demonstrations for Statistical Product First that we've started. And we're pretty excited about them. So the first demonstration that we have, so you should think of a demonstration as sort of an early stage experimental product. So here, many of our stakeholders have been telling us for a long time that they really need help in responding to data calls in federal grant applications. It is not easy for 
data users to wade through data.census.gov to get some basic statistics that they might need for a grant application. If you're New York City, you probably have a whole staff of data scientists that can do that. If you're Marshalltown, Iowa, you're going to hope that somebody at Iowa State helps you find the data elements that you need for your grant application because you don't have the staff in a small rural area to do that. So how do we level this playing field a little bit? So our conjecture was that there's probably a limited number of actual data elements or topics that federal grants ask for across the board of federal grants. If we could identify what those are, could we build a statistical product that would make it really easy for localities, in particular local governments, to pull this information and put it into their grant application. So we've worked with some data science teams at Georgetown, at Georgetown uh, for their capstones this past summer to help identify what are those topics and data elements in federal grants. And so they had a lot of creative ways to try to come up with that. And then also trying to understand how some of those topics and calls linked in with some of the census data that was pretty obvious to find. Um, but we're interested in even trying to find some of the non-obvious things we could do. And so now we have some teams within Census, one of our, our current data science cohort, that will be tackling the next stage of this in building a, st a statistical product or products that help meet this need. And then we'll be able to iterate with stakeholders to see, you know, is this useful or how might we modify it? A second um, demonstration that's just getting started is focused on state demographers and state data centers. And what we've learned here that it's really difficult sometimes for the for people to articulate what purposes and uses the statistical products need to support. And in working with the state data centers and the state demographers, the, that stakeholder group, you know, they shared with us that they get hundreds of questions, you know, across their constituencies every year. And they really grapple with trying to help support these questions. And they are partly constrained by the level of data that they have access to. So here the question is, can we actually build a tiered access model for them, sort of a research data center light model to help support their ability to link their data? And here it would probably be by geography, not by individual, in, not by individuals again, because that lift is very, would be very significant for them. But if they could bring in their data, you know, maybe code it up at different levels of geography, link it to some of our you know, some confidential, confidential extracts of our data, build some of their statistics, go through a disclosure avoidance process with us to then pull those out to help support their constituencies. So that's a whole process that we're trying to understand. We're right now in the throes of finalizing a couple states that we're going to work with to actually go through this process and see what it looks like. So we're looking for a few early adopters and we have our eye on some states, which I won't disclose right now. And then the newest of our demonstration products, projects, which I'm very, very excited about, is working with the American Indian and Alaskan Native stakeholder communities. So the Bureau collects data that overlaps with these localities, with these communities, with the tribal areas, and a lot of the work that we do, whether it's the census or the ACS or CPS or um, I'm sorry, I'm using acronyms, the current population survey, a lot in a lot of our administrative data. So, you know, we overlap these communities, but we thought, well, what if we were to actually engage directly and ask what questions and issues these communities need statistical products to support? And could we then possibly help develop statistical products that are targeted at their specific needs? You know, as opposed to it being, oh, we happen to have gotten this along the way to something else. So we've actually engaged with um, some of these folks through some uh, different meetings in the fall, the Bureau of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the National Congress of American Indians, and the National Indian Education Association, to start to talk to them and start to engage with some of their leadership to understand how we might develop, you know, some and co-develop really some statistical products with them. And it's fascinating, at least for me personally, it's fascinating. Uh, I'm not either an American Indian descent or an Alaska native. And I have learned that my life experience is so different from the life experiences of the people in these communities. And so trying to understand that and how we can try to support them in the development of some interesting statistical insights is just gonna be a fabulous journey to be on. 
and um, watch this space to see what we come up with. And then finally, the last demonstration that we're doing is on the AI readiness front. Um, and here, the big question is, how do we enable the layperson to engage with our statistical products through large language models or through other forms of AI or generative AI platforms? The way we disseminate things right now, they're not at all tagged or in proper schema to make that easy. Um, having our data recognize that if somebody is asking for poor folks in DC, that perhaps poverty would be a useful characteristic to provide them is not an obvious link in the way we disseminate things right now. So we really have to improve the contextual information and we need to embed that in our statistical products. And we also have to think about how do we do this in such a way that we help the user determine and identify and understand whether they are getting information that contextually is really what they're after and what they need. So do we have to be building some sort of interaction with the queries, have a conversation to really help get this um, you know, get this harvestability of our data into these platforms in the right way. So with that, I want you to imagine the art of the possible with me, and I am open for questions. Thank you, Sally. <clears throat> this was wonderful. So much food for thought, and uh, uh, our audience has already posted so many questions that I'm afraid I won't get my questions in later on, but this is a, a nice situation for a host. Um, so let me <clears throat> try to uh, summarize and, and channel a few of those posted. Um, there were a couple of questions related to um, the, the communication with the Census Bureau in two directions. One, if there are data products that are no longer supported, how would one know about that? And, um, you know, how, how can, you know, how can people give input into that process? There is an underlying assumption that you can't just add, right? I mean, I assume that certain data products um, might not longer be available. And likewise, you know, what, what, option does the public have to keep up with the development of the new products? You mentioned that grants data tool and things of that nature. So uh, both Danielle and Barrett had posted questions to that effect. Maybe you can speak to that first. Sure. So for the first question, uh, so no, so no, we can't just add, we're going to have to be smart. I think we can repackage, you know, certain things. But there's also the issue of let's just take the American Community Survey as an example. Um, I can't, you know, I don't know, there's probably billions of tables. I mean, I, there, there's billions of statistics for sure, but there's just hundreds and hundreds of tables that get produced. You know, so one question is, are there tables that really aren't being used or have very few users? And let's say it's tables that have very few users. Can we offer a different avenue for them to get that information through a different data concierge engagement or something so that we don't have to be continually producing and posting those pieces of information, but provide a different kind of engagement for users who might need things occasionally that 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 we have, but we're just not continuing to produce in a production mode. So we're thinking about that. How do we expand our data concierge engagement and activities? And how do we better understand what's being used and what's not being used in what we currently disseminate? And we're doing a lot of work on that front. And a lot of the historical focus has been on what are the highest hits of things that we produce? Well, you know, clearly the highest hits things we're not gonna remove, but what information do we have on what's the 10 lowest hits? And is there room for, you know, thinking about those things? Um, I hope we'll do a good job of communication as we're making different changes. And with this idea too, that it's to provide other avenues of engagement from a data concierge perspective with folks. And that same thing goes on how do how do people keep up with what we're doing? You know, we're working a lot with, you know, one of our, you know, pillars is, is stakeholder engagement. And we're working the whole Statistical Product First Initiative, our um, ADCOM, our Associate Direct, our Directorate for Communications, 
you know, is hand in hand in this whole initiative, the whole bureau is involved. And so they're really thinking about of all these groups that engage like the, the uh, dissemination specialists, you know, that are actually out there in the field, as an example, how, how do they help bring this message forward? And how is their engagement possibly going to change as a result of that? And then our stakeholders like you guys in your program, how do we engage with you so that you can help us um, with the communities that you engage with? There's uh, another set of uh, stakeholders, or maybe not stakeholders, but people to engage with, <clears throat> which is the folks working at census, right? The analysts yeah, and the exactly. like. Are there any mechanisms in place to uh, have that conversation with them as well? So internally, we're doing a lot of internal engagement and culture conversation around statistical product first. So that's an internal thing. But how do you engage with our researchers and our staff um, that's a the, that you know that is a great question. There's a lot of engagement that currently goes on, but is it well known how you can do that? And that's a great question. I don't know. I need to I need to think about that and take that back. That I don't know um, how well known it is how to engage. You know, pretty much any staff or researcher that gets an email. It used to be you had a phone list and you could actually call people. But I will say that I think we do a really good job at responding to any queries that we get. Um, you know, I'm actually quite astounded sometimes at, you know, the, the, the fact that we do do that with the volume that we get. But we need to think about how do you how do you start to even get more access directly to our researchers and help us co-develop these products? And right. we've talked about things like um, the, uh, you know, Kind of like a do we do we issue kind of uh, challenges that you can work with us on almost like a hackathon but more around a statistical product development process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, there. Let, let's shift gears a little bit from sort of engagement and, and knowing. Um, well, actually, one more on the stakeholders and engagement. There was one question in the uh, chat, um, like any everything you 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 discussed was sort of from the. Um, perspective that you are providing data, but obviously you're also maybe receiving data or you can be the middleman between, you know, someone uh, who needs uh, IS data and, uh, you know, or you would want that. I mean, is there anything planned in that uh, schema yeah. around that engagement? Yeah, absolutely. So partners are critically important, um, you know, for, for everyone. And so when I mentioned that we really don't want to be duplicative about things, we're very serious about that. So we would really like to engage with local and state governments, for example. And we know that there's tremendous amount of local and state data that could be really valuable for the statistic, statistical product development. And we would like to create those partnerships. But we need to understand what are the incentives to do that? There has to be something that these partners, you know, get back, right? Why, why would you give me what as we were talking to some of the some of the various tribes in this uh American Indian Alaskan Native discussion, you know, they have a really useful data, but for them to source it to us is incredibly time consuming. And why would they do that? Why would they want to do that? What can we provide that would give them incentive to do that? And so we definitely want to have a lot of those conversations to, you know, to try to help with that. I mean, states, as you know, um, many of them are trying to build integrated data systems across all their agencies. Well, you know, the Bureau's probably sitting on a lot of data that could automatically feed into those integrated data systems and reduce their work. How do we identify that and help develop that in such a way that then we also can, you know, help fill some of our gaps and actually help build the infrastructure to do that so that they could do that very effectively. So this is great because this is a good segue into a, maybe a little bit more of a touchy subject when it comes to the integration of data at various levels. Um, what is your thinking around uh, the disclosure processes and in particular um, differential privacy being applied to data products that then, you know, one would want to integrate with say lower level geographies and the like you know um can you maybe speak yeah, to that so another? absolutely so you know so obviously disclosure avoidance is really really important and so on several fronts we're you know we're thinking about things the tiered access that i that i spoke of you know is one model that will allow for you know more users to actually gain some access to 
you know, different extracts of confidential data that could help them. That, you know, perhaps working with the differentially private data at the lower levels of geography doesn't quite work with what they need to do, but if we can have a tiered access where they can be building their statistics, and then we can work together on what the disclosure avoidance is, you know, kind of coming out of that process, that, you know, that's one way that we think about that. But in addition, you know, we're thinking about uh, other approaches that could help the users. So we're really in the thick of thinking about synthetic data. How do we develop really rich synthetic data and couple that with processes by which someone can build their analyses? And so this will not be for the faint of heart, right? But they can build their analyses and they can understand even the art of what the possible of what might be available of data through just understanding the synthetic data and then have some sort of a validation or verification process that they can you know be sending their codes into the bureau to be run on the confidential data you know obviously disclosure avoidance would have to be applied but they can then you know be able to get some really rich results out and you know and can we do that in such a way that we're, you know, we're, we're, we're going to let it be a little bit of a wild west of what analyses they get to do, right? We're not going to necessarily, you know, make them write an SAP proposal to do this, but to do this in this kind of agile way. The synthetic um, uh, SIP, which is the statistics of um, income program participation, you know, is a great precursor to that. Can we do that on steroids now with more things? So, so there's, you know, a lot of things that we're thinking about there. Let me just press you on that a little bit more, you know, just because the the, the questions we have here in the chat are, you know, <laughs> quite specific. If the approach you have is a data use first approach, right, that would mean that when push comes to shove, you would loosen up a little bit on the privacy measures that apply to the data right now. So, you know, I don't think loosen up is probably the right <laughs> the right way to say that. But not quite a technical term, yeah, I get so, it. I was yeah. trying to so, not right. use terms like epsilon and whatnot because we don't right. want to commit to so, any specific. So formal, so formal privacy is not the only you know, method that we use for disclosure avoidance. And as many of you know, it's not ready to be used in a lot of different ways, not the least of which is on um, you know, a complex survey sample, right? We, we don't know how to do that yet. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that we have been doing, and we will be sharing this um, you know, probably in the I don't know exactly the timeline, but in the coming months and, you know, in the near term, we've actually taken time to ask ourselves, what are the properties or the principles that disclosure avoidance or a disclosure avoidance system should satisfy, no matter what the problem is, and no matter what the disclosure avoidance process is, what are the set of principles that you would want a good applied disclosure avoidance process to adhere to? in the protection of your data. And we've been very clear to separate that from how would you implement those things? So you mm -hmm. want a disclosure avoidance method to be able to assess the level of confidentiality and privacy you know, in the statistical product that you're gonna disseminate. But what the and I right apologize level for the is- loosening up. I hear you saying changing yeah. approaches maybe yeah. or, you know, right. depending yeah. on- Yeah, and so, so we will, you know, but, but, but how, you know, what's the right level of protection and, how are we actually going to do that? That's an implementation yep. issue. That's yep. not a principle of what disclosure avoidance should do. So we're yep. going to be very excited to, we're, we're doing a lot of internal circulation and coming to consensus on these things. And then we'll be bringing them out to you and, and just, you know, seeing what you think. And, and, you know, so at the end of the day, if I'm going to be protecting a statistical product, now I can start to go through what are all the different ways I can do that. I could aggregate things. I could do synthetic things. I could suppress yeah. things. You yeah. know, I could do formal privacy. Let's talk through and see what the pros and cons are of the different approaches. Great. There are three questions that are so specific that I'm going to read them out loud because um, there are acronyms in there that I can't all translate. So uh, Mary asks, um, is there a new section solely dedicated to a SDOH, DIA, or linked to current admin executives orders like 1399.5, 1398.5? You probably know what those are. And such much are. like the AZ environment and tribal projects. So I, I do not know all of those acronyms. So um, I need if I need help in interpreting this question. 
Okay, cool. Maybe someone can uh, unmute or allow Mary to uh, unmute herself. There you go, Mary. If you just gonna unmute and talk. <laughs> oh, we can't hear you. All right, let me do another one in between before uh, Mary um, has her microphone activated. Um, there was a question from Shauna, given OMB requirements to clear surveys, how do you include um, this requirement pl when planning new data products, especially when changes are, um, require revisions to survey forms? That's a really great question, and I thank you for that question. So. So yes, yeah, so right now there's a you know formal OMB process when um, a question might be added or deleted to a current survey um, or changed in some way. And what we would really like to see is in that process that there's attention paid to why is the change being asked for, why is a question being added, or why might a question be deleted, um, to understand what is the use you know, what is that, again, what is that, what are the questions that these, um, that these changes are trying to answer? And that kind of goes back to even the earlier question that if somebody is concerned about us no longer, um, no longer publishing some certain tables or statistics, we would really want to understand what are you using that for? Are there other ways that we could actually get at helping you answer those questions. And so that should really be part of the OMB process or part of the process as we're going through that cycle in some way. Um, and so, so we would have to go through that process if we wanted to do new data collection associated with the statistical product for sure. We would have to uh, amend data use agreements if there's a particular data source that we think would be very valuable to pull into a statistical product development and it was not part of the original use agreement. We will have to go through all those steps. So it looks like Mary has trouble um, unmuting. Can you try again, Mary? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Social determinants of health, diversity, oh, okay, equity, okay, okay. inclusion, accessibility. So all the things that you all are working on, and you gave some great exemplars of uh -huh. how you're working with the tribal population, uh -huh. how you're working with Arizona with the environment. So I'm wondering, is there a section kind of dedicated to that that we would be able to abstract and like maybe put with the, uh, like I work at SAMHSA, so we got the NISDA. And so it would be nice to, to be able to overlay or map the Census Bureau data with our data to see where the gaps are, right? Because we keep hearing that there's substance use uh, disorder and mental health problems across the country. And we have what we have, but we know that there's other agencies such as yourself that's collecting this data. So we just want to be able to really target and zoom in on the gaps. So that's where I was going with it. And, and were you all thinking about putting something like that, a compendium or something like that together, or working with us and other agencies to, to answer that question? Thank so you. Yeah, so we're very so, so Mary, we're very open to working with other agencies to help answer these answer these questions, and so maybe that's something we should take offline and okay. you know see uh, to get just more details on what you're thinking and kind of where we are with some of this. Okay, thank you so much, and it was an outstanding presentation. Oh, thank, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Sally. I um I will. I will explore the, the remaining questions that we saw in the chat. And I wanna say for myself, I really like your focus on dissemination. Maybe one suggestion or you know something for you to look into. I did notice that you know, in order to reach computational social scientists, the computer science community and what have you, they, they don't find the data on the web, census websites, right? They use GitHub, they, they build easily Python readable data products out of the American Community Survey, and then they call it folk tables, and then everyone yeah. gets folk tables instead of ACS, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, knowing where people look for data that you currently don't reach and expanding that path in the dissemination could probably also even enlarge the, the, the use that you spoke to at the very end. So I would love a conversation on that. Yeah, that would be great. And I would welcome help on that in, you know, figuring out how, what, where is that community we need to reach um, with that and how do we get their help? I think uh, the entire AI development community will, you know, eat you up with if they can yeah. get a hold of the data. They, they really, you know, they need benchmark data. And so this, right. this will be very exciting going forward.
Yeah, thank Happy you. to talk about that offline. Um, we will be saving the questions. The slides will be posted. And actually, next week, we have another exciting SODA symposium on the challenges, strategies, and other emerging issues around privacy, which we talked about today. So next week, we will be hearing from privacy stakeholders and um, an exciting commentary by Paul Ohm. So I hope you will be well, some of you will be able to join us. And uh, for today, I say goodbye. And thanks again, Sally. That was wonderful. Thank you.